back and be with us on a, on a personal level where we can meet with you, talk with you, and spend time with you because God wants us to encourage one another. And that's one of the ways that we do that is by doing that together. If you are at home, remember that you need some grape juice and some unleavened bread. If you need some of those containers and you're at home and you're doing this every week and you need some, uh, if you let us know, we can have somebody deliver some to you so that you have them. But our goal is to get you here in the auditorium with us. Remember that if, if by any chance any of you want to be here but you don't want to be in the building because you feel you're sick or something and you want to be in the parking lot, just let us know before service starts. We can turn that on for you and you can listen out in your, in your car if you'd like to do that. Uh, but remember, our goal is to get you here. That's what we want. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Glad the Lord's blessed you. You all look happy and, and nice today. Uh, I also see a bunch of runny noses because the out. <laughs> Allergies are so bad today uh, and yesterday that we're glad that you're here and we understand about the coughing and the sneezing and so and we also understand that if you're off coughing and sneezing because of allergies not because of anything that you're contagious with and so we're, we're thankful that you're here and pray that the Lord continues to bless you and keep you. Brother Don will be doing our, our, our song service and Brother Sandy will be doing the class in the back and I believe they're talking about the Apostle Paul. Is that right? Peter. Peter sorry, Peter. They're talking about Peter. I should be in your class. If I'm in your class, I'd know what's going on. I'd probably be smarter, too. Uh, but remember, it's for the kids that are uh, 2 to 10, and, Sa and Sandy's back there at the appropriate time. We'll tell you when you can take your kids back there so they can hear an age-appropriate lesson for them. Uh, we only make the adults suffer in here. Uh, our first song is going to be song number 378. So if you're here for the first time and you're new to us, uh, all of our songs are on the overhead. Make sure that if you can't read the overhead, there's songbooks underneath you. Grab a songbook and sing along with us because we want to praise God together as we strive to do His will. So Brother Don's going to be leading us uh, in song number 378, uh, The Solid Rock. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for everybody that came and helped yesterday. Amen. That was incredible. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's so good to see you all again in this first day of the week. Uh, at this time, uh, we're going to God in prayer. Pray with me, please. Dear Lord in heaven, we thank you. We thank you so much for, especially to let us be here today. We thank you for taking care of us when we were asleep, and especially we thank you for letting us wake up this morning. We ask the Lord to be with us as we go through the day, and we ask you to guide us, we ask you to forgive us, and help us to be strong in faith. Lord, we pray that for those who are not here today, we pray for the sick, and those who are unable to be here for different reasons. We ask the Lord to be with them, and help them if they're sick, and those who are out of town, bring it back safely to us. We thank you for being with us today as we come here and worship together, sing songs, and partake of the Lord's Supper. We ask the Lord to be with us as for the rest of the service, and we ask you to be with us always. We thank you for answering our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The song before the Lord's Supper we're going to sing right now is gave my life for the 340. Oh, 
Jesus Amen. has done everything for us. We hold him everything that we are and everything that we have. <clears throat> Good morning, family. Good morning. This portion of the service has been set aside for the Lord's Supper. We here meet on the first day of the week in a meeting. We do a number of items, and one of them is to remember our Lord and Savior, his life here upon this earth, and the suffering that he did for each and every one of us. As we read the word, we read the scriptures in Acts chapter 20, we see that apostles came together upon the first day of the week to break bread, and Paul preached until them until midnight. Um, Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, in more detail in reference to the Lord's Supper. And he writes this, For I have received the Lord, which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he break it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same hour, so he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the new testament in my blood. This do he often as he drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord, you do show the Lord's death till you come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For of this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Let us give thanks for the bread at this time. Dear God, we come to you here this morning. We're thankful. We're thankful for everything, dear me, Father, but especially for your son, Jesus. We're thankful for his life here upon this earth. We're thankful for all that he's done for us, and especially the sacrifice that he did upon the cross and him rising again upon the third day. We ask you, we follow this, we partake of this, we always remember the suffering that he did for each and every one of us. In Jesus' name we give thanks. Amen. 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 Let us partake. Let's give thanks for the cup at this time. Dear God, we come to you once again, giving thanks for this cup that we have here that represents your son's blood that was shed upon Calvary. And we ask you, we follow this, we partake of this blood, this cup that we'll continue to remember your son Jesus and his suffering and blood that was shed upon Calvary, that through him we have opportunity for everlasting life. In Jesus' name we give thanks. Amen. Amen. This does conclude the Lord's Supper. Separate and apart, we have the opportunity to give in Acts chapter 20 and verse 35 that says this, I have shown thee all things, how thou laboring you ought to support the weak and remember the words. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. We do have the opportunity to give. The basket will be in the back of the auditorium, so after service, if you wish to uh, leave your offering there. Also, you can mail your offering into uh, Church of Christ, P.O. Box 231005, Sacramento, California, 95823. Let us have a word of prayer at this time for the offering. Dear God, thank you for the many blessings you bestowed upon us. We're thankful for the source of the income that you've given us. And we ask, Heavenly Father, as we give back a portion of that, we give it that grocery necessity. We pray, Heavenly Father, this offering be acceptable to you and used for the further and the work being done here. And there's our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> song before our scripture reading and the sermon is going to be uh, 273 because of what Jesus did for us. He gave all for us. We are definitely not ashamed to own him every day. Even when we leave this place and people we walk with them and we spend time with their work, they need him. We need to speak up and have the courage to love them enough to share him with them. Amen. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to defend His cause. Maintain the honors of His word, the glory of His cross. Firm as His throne, His promise stands, and He can well say, Then will he 
Scripture reading is going to be taken from Joshua. Okay. Joshua chapter 2, verse 11 to 16. Then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the vows, and they forsook the Lord. And the Lord of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them, and bowed themselves down. To them. Thus they provoke God to anger. So they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Asteroids. The anger of the Lord bent against Israel, and he gave them into the hands of the founders to plunder them. And he sold them in the hand of the enemies around them, so they could no longer stand against uh, they could no longer stand before their enemies. Wherever they went, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had spoken and as the Lord had sworn to them, so that they were severely dis dis distressed. And the Lord raised up judges who delivered them from the hand of those who plundered them. Amen. Amen. Now it's time to take your children. If you have children like the we worship. <clears throat> Sorry about that, Karen. I guess the only place it doesn't work is where you're at. <laughs> I think there's too, too, too much interference in front of there. Sorry about that. Because uh, <clears throat> usually you sit in the second seat, I noticed, and so that, that might be it. Anyway, uh, we're glad all of you are here. And what we're looking at is looking at Jesus in the Old Testament. You will need your Bible for a couple of readings if you have one. Make sure you get it with you so you can follow along with us. But most of our texts are on the overhead. I don't necessarily see any visitors, but if we have a new visitor here, we certainly want to do everything we can to encourage you. And so we want you to know that if you want to, you can fill out your, your material on the board or on your paper that is uh, underlined. And it's going to be underlined on the overhead, so you can write that in your, in your paper so that you can have it. Um, Brother Greg, will you make sure the air is a little lower over here? Thank you. I see a couple of you fanning yourselves. Uh, so if you're visiting with us, that, that's, what, that's what you have there. And we hope that you can write those in. If, if you want to uh, uh, just not fill them out and you want me to help you afterwards, I can do that too as well. But we're looking at Jesus in the Old Testament. As we're doing that, we're in the book of, of Judges. And so if you have a, a Bible, that's the book of Judges. And you, uh, it's uh, one of those books that sometimes we read and, and we go through and we, we remember some characters that are in there. But let me tell you just simply about the book of Judges so that you remember what's going on here as we try to find Jesus in the book of Judges. Because that's what we're looking at is Jesus in the Old Testament. And Israel, remember, had been in captivity for over 400 years. They crossed the Red Sea. They received the law. They spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. And now they entered into the promised land. So as they get into the promised land, they're now going to be living in that promised land. During that time, they had no king. Now, that's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing that they didn't have a king. Really, when you think about it, in the Bible, you don't see any place where any of God's people ever had a physical king. So just because they don't have a king isn't a bad thing. I know sometimes people read a couple of verses in the book of Judges that says, and every man did what was right in his own sight because they had no king. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Because Jesus is our king, and he's up in heaven. But they entered into that land, and what would happen is, as they're living in there, that every once in a while they would leave God. And so in God's attempt to get them back, He would allow them to be subjugated. And then as they cried because of the suffering and the problems they were going through, He then would raise up a deliverer and would send them what we call a judge. Now that judge wasn't a judge like you and I think of a judge sitting on a court, but it was a judge that would come and defeat the enemy that God had subjugated them to. 
And so let's understand that and look at that as we look at the beginning of the book of Judges. In Judges chapter 2 and verse 11 it says, Then the sons of Israel, while they are living in the land of Canaan, did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were around them, and bowed themselves down to them. Thus they provoked the Lord to anger, so, the, so they forsook the Lord and served the, ba the Baals and the Ashtaroth. So God says what happens is that as they're in the land and they're living there, all of a sudden they forget about God. I don't think it happens like, boom, just like that. I believe it happens slowly. And what you and I need to understand is that as we live in this land and we become Christians, we're zealous and we're dedicated. And then all of a sudden as we live in this land, we slowly sometimes start to fall away. That's what happened with Israel as they were there. In Judges 3 and 7 it says, The sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and forgot the Lord their God, and served the Baals and the Ashtoreth. So they began to serve the gods that the world served, just like sometimes people do that today. And so as a result of that, God said that He would sell them into their sin, or into their captives. In chapter 2 and verse 14 it says, The anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and He gave them into the hands of plunderers who plundered them, and He sold them into the hands of their enemies around them, so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Wherever they went, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil. As the Lord had spoken and as the Lord had sworn to them, so they were severely distressed. And what I want you to notice here is God allowed them to go into captivity. We always want to see God as this loving, kind, gracious God who would never hurt anybody or never cause problems for anybody. But what you notice here is that God says... I am the one who let them become subjugated. I am the one that gave them into the hands of their enemies. I did that. Now here's what you have to remember. God wasn't doing that because He's cruel. God wasn't doing that because He's mean. God was doing that to try to get them to learn something. He was trying to get them to learn what happens if you leave God. And so He allowed them to be captivated by their captors. And that happens in our life today. And we can see people in our world today that are captured by their sin. We see individuals who are hooked on drugs. We see individuals who are hooked on pornography and gambling. And we see, uh, we see individuals who are, who are hooked on materialism. And, and they buy bigger houses and larger houses and storage places. And they buy bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And they're hooked on materialism. And we see individuals that are hooked on all sorts of different things. And we can see it in our world. And God allows them to be sold into those activities because they fail to believe in Him. In chapter 3 and verse 8 it says, Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, so that He sold them into the hands of the Cush Rehatham, king of Mesopotamia, and the sons of Israel served Cush Rehatham eight years. And so God allows them to be captivated by their sin. Here's what I want you to understand. If you're having problems in your life, if you're having difficulties in your life, I want you to understand something. God might be the one who's putting those in your way. And he might be putting those in your way for the purpose of getting us to turn to Him and serve Him. And sometimes we have to go through these difficulties in order for us to learn about God. You know, on some, uh, some of you probably don't know, but I have a, a class that I meet on Sunday evenings at a little retirement home uh, over here at, at a nursing place. Uh, where, where the, the older people are able to take care of themselves, but you know they have people where they come and they serve food and stuff. Uh, and I've been going there for years. And I remember there was a lady there that I met who was in a wheelchair. She was rather young for being in there, because generally you have in those places older people, you know, who are having trouble with making sure that they uh, are being taken care of, and so their kids put them in there to make sure they're being taken care of, because they need 24-hour care. But this lady was in there; she was fairly young, and so I began to talk to her, and she had told me that she was this executive in this company. And that she had uh, a, a, a beautiful house. She had lots of money. She had a retirement plan. She had, she had everything you could imagine, she said. And then all of a sudden, she had a stroke. And it paralyzed her. And she had trouble. And she was attending our church service. And as she attended, she started learning about God. And eventually, she was baptized. And I remember I sat down with her one day as I was talking with her and she says, she says, Mike, you know what? I want, I want to tell you something. She says, I am so happy that the Lord caused these problems in my life. And I said, why? 
She said, because if it wasn't for these problems, I would have thought I was okay. Because I was happy and had everything that I wanted, and I didn't realize that I was missing the most important thing, and that was God in my life. So as you read about what God does in the book of Judges, God is not being mean. God is trying to be a parent who loves them and wants them to change and wants them to get right with Him. That's what He's trying to be. And so God is doing that so they would repent. And when they would repent, God would send them a deliverer. He would send them what you and I call a judge. In Second uh, uh, Judges, uh, Judges chapter 2, verse 16, it says, Then the Lord would raise up judges who delivered them from the hand of those who plundered them. In verse 18, it would say, when the, when the Lord God raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judges. For the Lord was moved by pity by their groaning because of those who oppressed and afflicted them. God doesn't like us afflicted. It's just like when you and I see our kids going through trouble because of stupid things they do. But we say they got to go through that trouble. Some people are quick to bail their children out of trouble. Their children get in trouble and so they're quick there to bail them out. My wife and I were not. When our kids got into trouble, we let them wallow in it for a while. Because God is trying to teach them something through the consequences that they were going through. But we live in a culture today where we don't want anybody to suffer through their consequences. We don't even want anybody to feel bad because you say something to them. But God says, I'm doing this for a purpose. And the purpose is to bring you to me. In uh, chapter 3 and verse 9, it says, When the sons of Israel cried to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the sons of Israel to deliver them. God says we have to cry to Him. We have to realize that He's the one who takes care of us. He's the one that we can depend on. He's the one that gives us everything that we need. So sometimes God doesn't allow us to have everything we want because then we'll think we got it instead of He's giving it to us. Have you ever noticed that when God gave them manna, He didn't give them manna a week at a time. He gave them manna every day. Every day. And just enough for every day. Except on Friday. He gave them twice as much so they didn't have to go pick any on the Sabbath. God's trying to teach us something. You and I worry so much about our future sometimes that we forget about enjoying the present because we have the future in sight and we're so worried about the future. And here's the thing. We don't even know whether we have the future or not. But when they cried to God, God listened to them because He loves them and he, and he wants to help them. But He can't help people who don't want His help. And then what would happen? Well, they again, after He helped them for a while, became unfaithful. In chapter 2 and verse 17 it says, Yet they did not listen to their judges, for they played the harlot after other gods and bowed themselves down to them. They turned aside quickly from the way in which they, their fathers had walked in obeying the commandments of the Lord. They did not do as their fathers had done. Verse 19, But it came about when the, judges, when the judge died that they would turn back and act more corruptly than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and bow down to them. They did not abandon the practice of their stubborn ways. And that happens to us. Sometimes we have a problem and we come to God and we say, God, take care of this problem for us. And He does. And we're good for a while and then all of a sudden we go back and we start doing stuff that we shouldn't be doing. And before you know it, we're back in trouble again. God is trying to teach us something. Verse, three, uh, verse 12 of chapter 3. Now the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. See, there's consequences to sin. And those consequences are for our good. And so if we sin and we have consequences, don't blame God. Thank God. Thank God that He gives you consequences so you can see them and that you can repent and change before it's too late. Because God allowed their enemies... To test them. That was the purpose for those enemies that were left in the land. In chapter 2 and verse 21 it says, I also will, will, uh, will no longer drive out before you them any of the nations which Joshua left when he died. In order to test Israel by them. Whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk in, uh, to walk, uh, in it as their fathers did or not. 
So the Lord allowed the, those nations to, to remain, not driving them out quickly, and He did not give them into the hands of Joshua. God says, I allow the problems in the world to figure out if you're going to be faithful to me. You understand that that's why God had the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden when He said, don't eat of that tree? It was to test them. It was so that they could know whether, whether, or God could know whether they were going to be faithful to Him or not. So as you look in this world and you see all the crime and all the evil and all the wicked stuff that's going on, God is allowing it here for the purpose of testing us to make sure that we're going to be faithful to Him as we strive to live our life in this world. But what does that have to do with Jesus? Well, what I found interesting is I started going through the book of Judges and trying to look for Jesus. I was quite amazed when I came to one of the most important judges in that Old Testament book that you and I know, and we know him because his name is Samson. And we all remember Samson, don't we? We've heard stories of Samson's great feats, don't we? But what I found interesting was that as you go through the story of Samson, you see the story of Jesus in him. Matter of fact, I'd suggest to you that Samson, even though he was a man and he was flawed, was a type of Jesus. Because any man who is a type of Jesus is always flawed because they're not Jesus. But as you look at Samson in that Old Testament book, it's interesting to notice that both Samson and both Jesus came at a time when God's people were in trouble. In Judges 13 and verse 1, it says, Now the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. So Israel, the nation, was in the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. And by the way, 40 years generally means a, a generation in the Old Testament. Every 40 years you have a new generation. And God had given them over for 40 years to the Philistines. And it's at that time that God called Samson. And Jesus came. At a time when God's people were in bondage. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1 it says, And you were dead in your trans trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Now he's talking to the Gentiles there, but notice what he says about the Jews in verse 3. Among them, too, uh, uh, among them we too formerly lived. In the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as the rest. God says that Israel, when, he, when Jesus came, they were in trouble. They were in bondage. And all you have to do is read the New Testament and read the Gospels, and you find out that apparently they had no idea about what the Old Testament really meant because the main character of the Old Testament showed up, and they rejected Him. And they didn't see Him. And why is that? Because even though they were religious, they left God. You see, you can be religious and leave God. And Israel was a nation that was religious and left God. Because neither of them, Israel during the time of, of Samson's day and Israel during the time of Jesus' day, were receiving the word of God. In Judges chapter 2 and verse 11, it says, Then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods from among the, the gods of the, of the people who were around them and bowed themselves down to them. Thus they provoked the Lord to anger, so they forsook the Lord and served the Baals and the Asherah. They left God, and when they leave God, they start serving what the world serves. Here's what I want you to understand. We are sheep, not because we're Christians. We are sheep because we are human. Nothing you learned, nothing you know, was not known or given by somebody previously to you. We learned how to talk English because the people we lived with spoke English. We learned how to do math because they sent us to math teachers and math teachers already knew math and they talk you see we are sheep people have always been sheep God made us to be sheep we don't become sheep when we become Christians the question is who are we going to follow if we're sheep that's the question they rejected the word of God and if you reject the word of God then who are you going to follow the world you're going to follow the world in John 12 Jesus points out also that they didn't hear his word. Also what's interesting is that in Judges 13 and verse 3, 
the birth of Jesus and the birth of John the, of uh, Samson both were announced beforehand. In Judges chapter 3, 13 and verse 3, it says, Then the anger of the Lord appeared, uh, uh, I'm sorry, then the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, You shall conceive and give birth to a son. Even before Samson's mother was pregnant, the angel of the Lord came and said, By the way, you're having a special child. What happened with Jesus' mom? In Luke chapter 1, it speaks to us about the angel of the Lord appearing to Mary. And as he does so, here's what the angel says in Luke 1 and verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from, the city of, uh, from, this, from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. To a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at, that, at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, uh, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Samson's birth was announced before he was born, and Jesus' birth was announced before he was born. And both of them had miraculous births. In Judges chapter 3, talking about Samson's mother, the angel said to her, Behold, now you're barren and have borne no children. By the way, she was older. If she was going to have children, she would have had them by now. She was barren, like Sarah was barren when God called Abraham. And so it says, But you shall conceive and give birth to a son. She had a son by the miraculous power of God. And of course, you remember Mary, right, that we just read about. Mary, it says, was a virgin. Verse 27 says, To a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Both Samson and both Jesus had miraculous births. They both came at the intervention of God as God was dealing with man in both of their uh, time periods. And both of them were dedicated to God from their birth until death. In Judges chapter 13 and verse 4, as Jesus, as uh, God is talking to, to Samson's mom, it says in verse 4, Now therefore be careful not to drink wine or strong drink, nor to eat any unclean thing. For behold, you shall conceive and give birth to a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, for the boy shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he, shall, uh, and he shall begin to deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came to me, and, and his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God, very awesome, and I did not ask him uh, where he came from, nor did, I tell, uh, nor did he tell me his name. But he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and give birth to a son, and now you shall, uh, and now you shall not drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing, for the boy shall be, a na uh, shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Now, you know what a Nazarite was, because we've gone over it. A Nazarite is not a Nazarene. Jesus is a Nazarene. A Nazarene is somebody who comes from the city of Nazareth. A Nazarite is somebody who takes a special vow. Usually it's done by adults. Usually it's done through their own will. They willingly do it, and they do it for a period of time. They do it maybe for a month. Sometimes they might do it for a year. Some might do it a little longer. Uh, but it was something they did willingly on their own. And what they would do was they were mainly three things. They don't cut their hair, they don't eat grapes, and they don't touch anything dead. 
And all three of those things represent their separation from the world. That's what those three, that's what those three things represented. They were going to look different from the world because they didn't cut their hair. They were going to eat different than the world eats because they weren't going to eat any grapes or wine. And everybody in that culture drank wine. Although there's some of our brethren who find that kind of sinful. They all drank wine. They weren't supposed to eat wine or eat grapes or eat anything from grapes or raisins. And thirdly, they weren't to touch anything dead. Not even their dead parents. If their dead parents died, they weren't allowed to touch them because they, they were separated from death. And that picture represents Jesus. Jesus is different than the world. Jesus came into the world and though he was part of society, he was not included in that part of society that was sinful. And thirdly, Jesus had nothing to do with death, but everything to do with life. Jesus came into the world to be king. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 31, as the angels talked to Mary, he said, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Jesus, even before he was born in this world, God said he's going to be special, and he's got a special job. Just like Samson was going to be born into the world, and he had a special job. His job was to deliver, to deliver Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Jesus' job was to set up a kingdom from which we could be delivered from all of our enemies. And Jesus, being king, would set up his kingdom forever. Samson's activity only lasted for about 40 years until they rebelled again and they needed a new judge. But Jesus' activity would last forever. Last forever and ever. By the way, do you know why, until recently, do you know why we were called B.C. and A.D. when you took care of time? You know, because it was before Christ, and then it was after his death. It's actually what, uh, uh, it's a Latin word that means uh, the Lord's death. Anybody know why that happens like that? Because it's very difficult in history to tell when activity happens. Because what would happen is that when another king came into power, he would basically erase all the history from the, from the king before him, and he would start a new calendar the day he became king. And the day he became king, a new calendar would start until what? Another king came and took his place. And then he would wipe out that calendar, and he would start his calendar. Guess who came into the world? Jesus. Guess what started when Jesus came into the world? A new calendar. Guess what hasn't ended? <laughs> that new calendar because Jesus is the king of the world and even though in our culture and in our irreligious system today they want to change it to what they call the common error it's always going to be AD and BC Jesus was going to be king and he was going to be king forever Samson is a type of Jesus He's not Jesus. But he shows us what Jesus was coming to do. He was going to usher in a new period and a new time where you and I would be able to have the forgiveness of our sins and be freed from our enemies. And both were to serve till they died. Remember I told you that generally a Nazarite vow was taken by an adult and he would generally take it for maybe a short time, a few, sometimes months, sometimes weeks, sometimes maybe a couple of years. But it generally wasn't done for their whole life. Samson was to be a Nazarite from the time of his birth to the time of his death. Matter of fact, his mother couldn't even eat grapes while she was pregnant. In Judges 13 and verse 7 it says, For the boy shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. God said, Samson was mine. And he was going to be my servant from the time he was born to the time that he died. And that suggests for you that not only is he a picture of Jesus, but he's a picture of us. That when you and I are baptized into Jesus Christ and we're born anew, we are born from that time on to be forever Jesus's. From the time that we were born in that new birth, to the time that we die, we are going to be His.
We belong to him. Samson was going to serve to the time of his death. And certainly we understand that Jesus served till the time of his death. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus was talking to his disciples about greatness. Jesus said to them, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. One of the differences that I felt when I became a Christian was a difference on my perspective of death. Before I was a Christian, I didn't think much about death. Before, before I was a Christian, I didn't think much about how I was going to die or what was going to happen. It was just about me and what I wanted to do. After I became a Christian, God turns your attention to your final day. And He does it in a number of ways. He does it by watching your children grow old and holding their hands as you take them to the first day of elementary school. And those of you who are parents know that feeling, don't you? When your child goes off into elementary school for the first time, and when you send them away, if they go to college, to college. And then you start looking at death as you begin to have to deal with your parents as they get older, and you're having to take care of them, and you realize that they're going to need you as they approach closer to death. And then you start realizing that you're going to die also. And so you're going to try to figure out what you're going to do. And God slowly points your attention to that day. Because for you and me as Christians, there is no more important day once we become Christians than the day of our death. Jesus and Samson came into this world and their goal was how they were going to die. Jesus says, I came to give my life a ransom for God. Jesus came to die. He died for us, but he also died because it was the will of his Father who's in heaven. And as far as I know, other than Enoch and maybe Elijah, everybody has met that day one way or another. And it's interesting that both of their fathers had to be convinced well, I can kind of understand that. Samson's mother comes to her, 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 her husband and says, Hey, an angel of the Lord appeared to me and says, I'm going to get pregnant. Well, you know that's not the first time they tried, right? And she comes and she says that to him, and he's thinking, Yeah, right. Sure. Yeah, that's going to happen, right? When's the last time your wife or your, well, your wife has come, come to you and said, Hey, I'm going to be pregnant in a couple of days. It doesn't happen. What are you going to do if she says that to you? You love her, right? You don't want to tell her she's nuts. So they had to be convinced. In Judges chapter 6 and verse 13, it says, So the angel of the Lord said uh, to Mona, Let the woman pay attention to all this that I said. She should not eat anything that comes from the vine, nor drink wine, or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. Let her observe all that I commanded you. Now, I'm pretty persuaded that one of the reasons why the angel told this to, to uh, uh, Manoah was because when your wife goes on a diet, guess who else goes on a diet? <laughs> and says, Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, Please let us detain you so that we may prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord said to uh, Manoah, Though you detain me, I will not eat from your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name? So that, so that uh, when your words come to pass, we may honor you. But the angel of the Lord said to him, Why uh, do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it on a rock to the Lord. And he performed wonders while Manoah and his wife looked on. The angel said, she is going to have a son. And you better be careful what you eat. And to prove it to you, I'm going to do these signs. And one of the signs that he did was fire came down from heaven and devoured that food that they'd set on that altar. And it went up. And the angel went up in the presence of the Lord. And I think if that happens, you might want to believe your wife. 
But he wasn't the only one that had that problem. Joseph was unsure. He comes to Mary, the lady he's been betrothed to for years, who he thought was faithful, and he comes to her, and she's got a little belly. You know, the first thing he's thinking, right? Too much pudding. That's what he wants to think. But as he examines things, he finds out she's pregnant. And as any self-respecting Jewish person who was faithful to God during that time, and not wanting to stigmatize his family, he was minded to put her away privately, and he was thinking about doing that. And in verse 18 of Matthew, I'm sorry, uh, Matthew 1, sorry, and verse 18, it says this, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When Mary... Uh, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, behold, they came together, and she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had, but when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the Lord by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary his wife, but kept her a virgin until she, became, she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Both of them had to be assured by an angel of the Lord that their wives were actually speaking the truth. And both uh, Samson and Jesus were empowered by the Holy Spirit. If you've read the book of, of Judges and you read about Samson, and you know about Samson, you know that Samson did all these strong feats of strength that he did during the time that he was uh, destroying the Philistines. And one of those times it says in Judges 14 and verse 6, it says, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, so that he tore, uh, he tore him, this is speaking about a lion that he, that he encountered, so that he tore him as one tears a young goat, though he had nothing in his hands, but he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. And I find it interesting that he defeats this lion, right? Even though I didn't write this for you. Jesus, to his activity, defeats Satan. And the Bible describes Satan as a roaring lion walking around seeking whom he may devour. In verse 19 of the same book in chapter in Jude, I'm sorry, in Judges chapter 14, in verse 19 it says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, and he, and he went down to Ashkelon, that's the Philistine capital, and killed 30 of them and took their spoil and gave the changes of clothes to those uh, who uh, told the riddle. And his anger burned, and he went home to his father. He was going to get married. And as he was going to get married, there was a custom in their land that you throw this party and you invite all of your friends. Well, her friends were Philistines. And so they, he, so uh, Samson pondered a riddle to them about the lion he had killed. Because the lion he had killed, the next day or a couple days when he came by, the carcass was there and he found a honeycomb inside of it. And so he had gone and he had taken some honey and he got, got his stick. Now, remember what a Nazarite not supposed to hang around, right? dead things, but that's Samson. He goes and he takes this, and he, he eats some of the honey, and so he gives them a riddle about what is strong and, and, and uh, 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 that produces something sweet. And he gave them that riddle, and for seven days, they were trying to solve the riddle. And if they didn't solve the riddle, then they were supposed to give each, each of them were to give him a change of clothing. And if, he were, if they got the riddle, he was going to give them a change of clothing. Well, they went and they talked to his wife, and they, or his intended, and they said, if you don't tell us, we're going to kill you, and we're going to burn your house down. And we're going to burn your family down, too. And so Samson told her the riddle on the last day, and she told the Philistines, and they were coming for their 30 changes of clothes. And God sent Samson into the Philistine land in order to get their changes of clothes. That's what that was about. But he did it by the power of the Spirit when he did it. 
Verse 14 of chapter 15 says, when he, uh, when he came to Lehi, the Philistines shouted as they met him. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, so that the ropes that were on his arms uh, were as flax that is burned with fire, and, 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 his bound, and his bonds dropped from his hands. The Philistines had come over to Israel and said, Look, Israel, you're under us. We're going to come, we're going to cause trouble for you unless you hand over Samson. Samson has been created to have it for the Philistines. So they come to Samson. Judah comes to Samson and says, Samson, they want you. They're going to kill us if, if, if you don't go over to them. Samson says, fine, but don't kill me. So they bound him with some new cords, new ropes. They bound him. And they delivered him to the Philistines. And when he was there, as soon as the Spirit of the Lord came on him, he broke those cords like if they were nothing. And then he defeated the Philistines that were there. Now remember, this is all God's plan. And Jesus, before he did any miraculous gifts that were supernatural, had to have the Holy Spirit come down on him. And you remember when that happened, don't you? When he was being baptized, the Holy Spirit comes down on him. Verse 15 it says, But Jesus, Matthew 3, 15, But Jesus answering them, said to, said to him, or answering him, Permitted at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And he permitted them, him. And after being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the waters, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him, and behold, a voice out of heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus, at that time, began what we call his public ministry. And from that time on, Jesus was able to do miracles and do things that other people couldn't do by the power of the Spirit that was on him. Because in both cases... The power of the Spirit proved who was behind the activity. In 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 3 it says, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. How did we know that Jesus was the Lord since he had been here for 30 years as a regular human, and even his brothers didn't believe it, that he was anything special, how in the world would we know that inside that body there was actually deity inside there? And the answer is, when the Holy Spirit came on him, and he began to do miracles, then people understood that this Jesus was more than just a man. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 4, it says, He who had declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And let me suggest to us that when you and I are baptized in Jesus Christ, He says that we get the gift of eternal life and we have the Spirit. He gives us the Spirit. And the purpose for that Spirit is to, to get in us to do the activity of God. And the more you read the Word of God the more the Spirit of God gets in you and the more you'll be able to do His will and serve Him. It's by the Spirit that's in us and the Spirit that was in Jesus and the Spirit that was in Samson that people will be able to see God because it is extremely difficult to forgive unless you have the Spirit of God. It's difficult to to turn the other cheek unless you have the Spirit of God. It's hard to bless people who are persecuting you unless you have the Spirit of God. Samson and Jesus were identified in their activity by the work of the Holy Spirit in their life. And both of them were betrayed for money. In Judges chapter 16, we have the story of him and Delilah. And most of us remember that story of Samson and Delilah. Samson's problem was that he liked women. And there was this one whose name was Delilah. And Samson would go into her every so often. And so the Philistines knew that. And they came to her, and verse 4 says in Judges 16, And after this it came about that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him and see where his great strength lies and how we may overpower him that we may bind him to afflict him. 
then we will each give you 1,100 pieces of silver. See, they knew that there was something that Samson had that other people didn't have that was the reason why he had the power that he had. They knew Samson didn't have that power just because he had a lot of muscles. They're looking at Samson and they're going, Samson has something with him that's giving him this power. We want to know what that is and we want to know how to get rid of that so that we can treat Samson like a regular person. And we can bind him. And they offered her money. And how did they find out where Jesus was going to be on the night he was betrayed? Because Judas was offered money. In Matthew 26 and verse 14 it says, Then one of the twelve named Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me to betray him to you? And they weighed out 30 pieces of silver. It's interesting that they gave more. The Philistines were, given, were willing to give more to finding Samson's power than the Jews were to defeat Jesus. 30 pieces of silver. And both were betrayed by women who were supposed to love them. Or that they love. In Judges 16 and verse 15, Samson is with Delilah. And, he, and as he's with her, she's asking him and begging him, what gives you this great power you have? What is it? And for a few days, he wouldn't give in. He wouldn't give in. But then it says this in verse 15. And then she said to him, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have deceived me these three times that have not told me where your great strength, uh, where your great strength is. She says, I keep asking you where your great strength is and you don't tell me. You lie to me. You tell me these different things and, and, and you break out of all those things that you've tell, told me to do and yet your strength is still with you. You don't love me. And Jesus was betrayed by Israel. And Israel is often called the daughter of Zion. In Matthew chapter 23 and verse 37, Jesus speaking about Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your, your children together. The way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were unwilling. God said, I loved you, uh, Jerusalem. I loved you, Judah. I was trying to protect you. I was trying to spread my wings over you like a, like a, a hen does when there's a hawk flying around and wants to cover her chicks so that they don't get hurt. I wanted to cover you. I loved you. John 1 and verse 11 says, in, He came to His own, and those who were His own did not receive him. I pray that none of you do, but I, none, but I know that some of you probably have. Lived in a home where you've never felt wanted or lived in a community where you've never felt accepted or been to a school where you've never fe felt like you fit in. Jesus says, I came to my own. And they didn't receive me. He says, I know how you feel. I know what it feels like to be rejected. And even worse, to be rejected by that person whom you love. In Matthew 27 and verse 22, when Jesus was being crucified, Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with, it, with, with Jesus who is called the Christ? And Jesus' wife, his bride, says to them, crucify him. Both of them were betrayed by women who were to love them. And, and both of them gave up their strength to women. In Judges 16 and verse 17, let's read a little bit about this story. It says, so he told her all that was in his heart because she kept bugging him, 
finally, she said, if you love me, you'll tell me. So he told her all that was in his heart and said to her, a razor has never come on my head. For I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am saved, then my strength will leave me and I will become weak and be like any other man. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all that was in his heart, he sent and called the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more, for he has told me all that was in his heart. Samson said, If I stop being different from the world, if you shave my head and you act like and I act like I'm like everybody else in the world, my power will leave. When we leave God and go off in the world, our power to stay faithful becomes extremely, extremely difficult. Because we've left Him who is the source of our power. And He said to her, Shave my head. Verse 18 it says, Then the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hands. And she made him sleep on her knees and called for a man and had, and had him shave off the seven locks of his hair. And then he began to afflict him and his strength left him. And she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. She'd said that four other times and every time Samson would get up and he'd break the looms of, of the, uh, or he'd break the uh, net of the, of the loom where she had bre uh, weaved his hair and he broke the, the flax that she had tied him with. And, and for three other times he would break it and he would conquer the Philistines. Except this time she afflicted him and his strength was gone. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out at, at, as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. You see, his strength wasn't in his hair. That wasn't where his strength was in. His strength was in the Lord. The hair was just a symbol that he was going to do what the Lord said. The strength of the Lord isn't that you and I attend here. But this is a proof that you and I want to serve the Lord. And so He's with us. And He gives us the power to overcome our sin and our wickedness. And He takes care of us and He provides for us. But when we leave here, if we decide we don't have to come here anymore, that's like cutting our hair. It's like Samson cutting our hair. And the power for us to remain faithful to God will, will wane and fall. How many people do you know that were faithful to God, and all of a sudden their attendance starts to slip. And you don't see them for a while, and maybe we don't care enough to call them. And then we don't see them for a while, and we don't care enough to call them, and then we realize they haven't been here for a while, and we start to call them, and it's too late. Because without God, sin has its hold over us. Samson didn't know that the Lord had departed from him. And then the Philistines seized him and, and gouged out his eyes and they brought him down to uh, Gaza and bound him with bronze chains and he was a grinder in the prison. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after it was shaved off. I didn't give you this one either. But Jesus, before he died, it got dark in his world for three hours. Samson's world got dark. They poke at his eyes. And Jesus was betrayed by the daughter of Israel. In Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 8, it says, The daughter of Zion, that's talking about Jerusalem. The daughter of Zion is like, uh, is like a shelter in a vineyard, like a watchman's hut in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. Jesus came to Israel, his bride, whom he loved. That's the story of the Old Testament, how much God loved Israel. And God loves faithful people. But Jesus gave up his strength for her. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7, starting in verse 6 says, talking about Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, had all the power of God, had all the glory of God, 
And although he exists in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. And taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, he gave up his glory. He gave up his strength to live with us and to live down here so that he could save us. And both of them destroyed temples when they died. In Judges 16 and verse 28, Samson having his eyes put out, there was a big festival going on in the temple of Dagon. And this little kid was leading him in there because they were going to make fun of him. And they had him in chains. And he asked the young man to take him by the two main pillars that were there. And here's the story. And then Samson called to the Lord and said, Oh Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me just this time. Oh, oh God, that I may at once be avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested and braced himself against them, and the one with his right hand and the other with his left hand. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bent with, uh, and he bent with all his might so that the house fell and the lords and all the people who were in it. And Samson pushed those pillars and because they were the foundation for the whole Colosseum, it all fell. And he said, let me die with them. And Jesus died with sinners and destroyed the temple of the Jews. In John 24 and verse 1, it says, in Matthew 24 and verse 1, it says, Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came and pointed out the temple building to him. And he said to them, Do you not see that all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. And all you have to ask yourself is, does, do the Jews have a temple today? No. Who destroyed it? Jesus did. Why? Because God does not dwell in temples made by hands. He never did. He never has. He never will. But he dwells in his church. And both died to destroy the power of the captors. In Judges 16 and verse 30. So the, de so the dead who he killed at his death, speaking of Samson, were more than those whom he killed in his life. And Jesus destroyed the power of sin when he became Lord. In verse 36 it says of Acts 2, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. In Hebrews 2 and verse 14 it says, Therefore since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Jesus is our Samson. So when sin has you by the throat, you might need to remember this because somehow we have probably left God. And we've become entangled in the world. And friendship with the world is adultery to God. And a person needs to repent and change and turn to God. In James 4 and verse 6 it says, But he gives a greater grace. Therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. If you humble yourself in the mighty hand of God, uh, the mighty hand of God, he will forgive us. The people who are not forgiven are the people who act like they can stand before God just the way they are in their sin and think that God doesn't care. Submit therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Mourn over your sins and come to him. And he will deliver us from our bondage. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4 it says, But God being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been, uh, by grace you have been saved 
and, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his, of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. That is a result of works so that no one may boast for we are, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we may walk in them. Jesus is our Samson. When we turn our backs on God, Jesus is ready to deliver us when we acknowledge our sins, repent, and cry to Him for help. Those who repent and accept Jesus' Lordship in baptism will be freed from their sins. If we need to help you encourage you, let us know while together we stand and we When we walk with the Lord in the light of the such an honor to be here today. Another fine lesson from Brother Mike. Uh, shall we go to God in prayer? 
Father God, it is such an honor to be amongst your people who come here to worship you, to praise your name. Father, to lift up our voices as we honor you, give you the glory for all things. We thank you for our very lives. We thank you for our night's rest and the health that we enjoy this morning, that we could come and meet together and to commune with you. Father, there's many, <laughs> excuse me, many on our prayer list that need your special care and attention. One that is not on our prayer list is our brother Mike's mother, who has discovered she needs to have surgery on her neck, but in doing tests for her, they discovered that she has a murmur in her heart. Father, we just pray that you would you would bless the doctors that are caring for her, that they would do whatever is necessary to sustain life on this earth, to give her a better quality of life with a, with a healthy heart and also without the pain and suffering in her neck. Pray that you be with her family and just remove their anxieties knowing that she is in your hands. Father, we pray for those listed on our our prayer list today for those that are suffering from COVID. <clears throat> for I know of five people on the list that all have been diagnosed, have tested positive for COVID. We thank you for those who have had COVID in the, recently and, and are with us today, namely Carolyn. And Father, we are just so grateful for all that you do for us. We just thank you for so many answered prayers. Prayers that have been made public, some that were private. Father, regardless of whether they're public prayers or private prayers, we know that you hear and answer every prayer. And we thank you for your compassion. We thank you for loving us. We pray, Father, that you be with us through this week. And as we go out, go through our, <clears throat> our daily routines, whether it be at work, at school, help us to place you first in all that we do. Help us to dedicate our lives to you. Father, we thank you for Mike and, and these lessons <clears throat> that that bring Jesus to the forefront of our minds as we read the Old Testament. That we see how he has been with his children throughout eternity. And we can receive and believe his promise that he will never leave us or forsake us. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's good seeing everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank Brother Mike for his lesson and the hard work that he puts into making sure his lessons are put together and timely. Uh, reiterate what Brother Bill said in reference to the bulletin and the prayer list. Please keep them in, in mind, especially those who are sick and those who are shut in. Uh, please uh, use the, uh, the calendar or the directory and reach out to them, please. Uh, be mindful we have our ladies' fellowship shortly thereafter service this morning. Uh, the bazaar turned out to be successful. Special thanks for everyone who came out to make sure that worked. For those that were here, those that dropped off items, uh, it was very successful, so thank everyone for all the hard work. Uh, we have the service meeting shortly, they're after service as well. 
Let's see what else we want to go over. Kids camp's been postponed, so uh, we'll be reaching out to some folks to see if we can get some instructors and some teachers for the one in August. So hopefully uh, we can get two uh, teachers or get four uh, to co-teach. So we need two classes taught. So we'll reach out. We have some te technical issues that we get squared away really quickly, but uh, we do need a couple people to help out with the class. So please be mindful of that. Um, Patricia and I will be traveling uh, for the holiday for this week, so we'll be out. So keep us uh, in your purse as well. Um, that's about it. Anything else before we dismiss? Thank you.